glorify your name in all the earth. And we pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn in them to Luke chapter 11. We're going to begin uh, where we left off last week in Luke 11, 37. Luke 11, 37. So this week we're, we're picking up, like I said, right where we left off. And really we're kind of in the middle of a story that's still unfolding. In our passage this morning, the Pharisees and the experts in the law are going to be confronted with their hypocrisy. In fact, you might even say their hypocrisy knows no bounds. And so Jesus here, as he talks with these Pharisees and experts in the law, in the home, on the turf of, as it were, a Pharisee, he's going to really provide a perfect illustration of what he's just said outside to the larger group. If you recall from last week, what he said wasn't really great, particularly if you are the Pharisees and the experts in the law. In fact, in the previous text that we've been looking at, Jesus has asserted that the casting out of the unclean spirits by the finger of God, keep that phrase in mind, demonstrates that the kingdom, the reign and rule of God has come to earth and that the reign and rule of God has come to earth because he's there. His presence means the reign and rule of God has arrived. From there, he goes on to tell a parable about the terrible result that comes from casting out an unclean spirit, which he has done and will do and In the book of Acts, his followers will do, but not replacing the empty space left behind when the strong man has come and cast out this unclean spirit. There's an empty space, and if that empty space is not filled in with someone or something who is greater in essence, what you've done is you've cleaned up the residence without a new resident, And as a result, you're just making your property more attractive to these unclean spirit squatters. It would be like flipping a house and leaving it empty for someone that isn't going to pay for it to come and live there. They don't have any right to it, just like the unclean spirits don't have any right to people made in the image of God. But unless someone moves in and takes residence there, it's just an empty shell ready to be exploited all over again. And as he continues, he then warns the sinful generation about their evil. We're going to see that come up again in our text today. He chastises them about their unbelieving posture through two stories, the story of Jonah and the story of Solomon, when Gentiles recognized their greatness and the greatness of their message, and at least in the short run, were affected by it. When Jonah went to Nineveh and preached that God was going to destroy it and the people repented in sackcloth and ashes, they heard the message of Jonah and now someone greater than Jonah is here and you folks who are a part of God's people don't recognize that he's greater than Jonah. Or when the queen of the south came from Africa to hear the wisdom of Solomon, the wisest king and maybe the wisest man the world had ever known to hear his wise words. She had heard of him and wanted to hear from him. Now the followers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of their line, hear one who speaks with words that are wiser even than Solomon's, but yet they don't have the wisdom to believe. And so you can understand that this evil generation is on the brink of judgment. Particularly when we get to verse 35 and Jesus says these kind of ominous words, make sure that the light in you is not darkness. If what you think is light 
is actually darkness, you're in a very dark place indeed. Now, that sounds really negative and scary, but there is hope. So let's read together what the scriptures say here, beginning in verse 37. So, as he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed that he did not first perform the ritual washing, uh, quite literally to immerse his hands. The word there is the word that we use for baptize. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and evil. Fools. That's a big word. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Jesus is very careful to tell folks to be really hesitant about using this word. He's going to use it about the rich fool in chapter 12. Didn't he who made the outside make the inside too? This is talking about God. But give from what is within to the poor, and then everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees. You give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and love for God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the front seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you! You are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't know it. Now, one of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. Like, whoa, slow down. Then he said, Woe also to you experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, and yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you. You build the tombs for the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Yikes. Therefore you are witnesses that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their monuments. Because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. So that this generation may be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who, per who, perished, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible. Woe to you experts in the law. You've taken away the key to knowledge. You didn't go in yourselves and you hindered those who were trying to go in. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to oppose him fiercely and to cross-examine him about many things. They were lying in wait for him to trap him in something he said. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to your word... We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your truth. That, that you would, by your spirit, confront us with the darkness in ourselves that we think is light. That we would not fall prey to the trap of saying, look at those awful Pharisees and fail to see the same tendencies in ourselves. But Lord, I pray that we would, because of the work of your Spirit, not at the end of our journey through this passage this morning, be angry but we would be broken. Broken because of our sin and hopeful because of the greatness of our Savior. Lord, I pray that as we, as we are confronted with hard things, the 
grace would be in abundant supply. And we would be transformed for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you um, paid really close attention to the title, you might wonder or might not be surprised at where this is headed. So, Tombstone. For all its historical license was and is a Western at the top of my list. Now, there will be some spoilers, but this movie came out in 1993. If you haven't watched it, it's your own fault. At the heart of the movie, beyond the mountain of one-liners delivered by Val Kilmer in the role of Doc Holliday, here's just one, as he's uh, in a poker match with Ike, a member of this renegade crew that they're going to, in the end, kill. He's going to say something like this. Maybe poker isn't your game, Ike. And if you see Ike, you will know why this next part is funny. I know. Let's have a spelling contest. And Ike, he couldn't spell cat if you gave him the C and the T. But at the heart of this is the deep friendship between the lawless Doc Holliday and the lawman who really wanted to be anything but, he just wanted a normal life, Wyatt Earp. This is really a buddy movie at the heart. So when the posse is established for the reckoning that will come to the cowboys who murdered Wyatt's brother Morgan, Doc is deputized but refuses to wear the badge. Because he recognizes the hypocrisy of an unashamed, unrepentant killer presenting himself as a keeper of the law when all he is is lawless. But a little bit later in the story, well, Wyatt is facing a battle he can't win with a gunslinger named Johnny Ringo. And Doc, he kind of, well, he lies quite unashamedly again to make Wyatt think that he's there in the bed with his tuberculosis and he's just, he's just out. And Wyatt puts his badge on Doc and basically says, I'm going out to kill this guy. There's no law in me either. But then something interesting happens. Doc gets out of bed, he puts on the badge, and he goes out to face Johnny Ringo because, well, he's faster. And he'll win. But before he shoots Johnny Ringo in the head, sorry, that's the spoiler, he shows him he has his badge and it's all legal and good. Well, when Wyatt shows up with a dead Johnny laying on the ground, Wyatt finds him with a badge sitting on his chest. And Doc says these these fairly powerful words, his hypocrisy only goes so far. He's not going to continue the charade. He's not going to continue acting like he's the good guy because he's the bad guy. But then we get to the end of the movie. Doc reaches the end of his battle with TB and the story takes one last turn. In the movie's final scene, the story has this twist. Doc arrives to visit. They've got a running game of cards and apparently Wyatt is still losing to the man who can barely breathe. But as Wyatt arrives to visit, there's a priest there who has given Doc the last rites. And when Doc wakes up, he explains with only the pace of speech that that you could have in that movie, Father Feeney and I were just investigating the mysteries of the Church of Rome. And then he says these words, it appears my hypocrisy knows 
no bounds. It seems that staring at death at the end of a long battle with a debilitating disease has created an unease even in Doc Holliday. An unease that wasn't present even when he was staring down the barrel of a loaded gun. And fear has made him a hypocrite. And he hates it. In fact, all of us hate hypocrisy in other people. But we struggle to see it in ourselves and do a good bit of work to explain it away as not really hypocrisy at all. In our passage this morning, Jesus is going to point out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and these experts in the law, and he's going to condemn it. Now, as we read this, as we study this this morning, our tendency is likely going to be to pile on to these opponents of Jesus. That's the easy way out. Let's pile on to the Pharisees. Let's say, say I'm not going to be like them rather than doing what we need to do, and that's put the mirror up to our face to look ourselves in the mirror to really examine who we are, to ask the Spirit to reveal those hypocrisies to us, and rather than allowing us to be angry at the one who told us we're hypocrites, let's be repentant, confess our sins, and leave this place in the newness of life that Jesus offers. So let's see how the story starts. The setting is a midday meal. So this midday meal comes on the heels of Jesus' teaching. And I would imagine that the scribes and Pharisees, these experts in the law and these Pharisees were interested in what Jesus said, but it doesn't seem that there's contention quite yet. In fact, they probably are like we would have been thinking Jesus is talking about those other folks, those other hypocrites. Yeah, not us. We're not like that. We're the good guys. When we get the realization that maybe we're the baddies, it's not easy to swallow. So there's an invitation to the meal. As he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. Now here is where things start to take a turn. Now you would think that reclining at the table, not a big deal. Oh, it's a big deal. We see this in the next verse. So in the next verse, when the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed. He marveled. Why did he marvel? Not because Jesus cast out a demon, not because Jesus raised a dead person back to life. He marveled because Jesus didn't take the amount of water that would go in one and a half eggs and pour it on his hands in a ritual way to say that he was clean. And this is not for hygiene, this is for purity. He didn't baptize his hands, okay? So he's amazed that he did not first perform the ritual the ritual washing before dinner. So now we've got this situation. Jesus shows up. He's the visitor. He's not in on his turf. He's on their turf. He's come in. He's sat down. He's reclined, sort of leaning on his side, probably a midday meal. Some think it's on the Sabbath, but there's nothing that Luke says about that necessarily. So he's shocked that Jesus would not perform the ritual, the ritual washing before he ate. Now, as we look at this, We need to look at the players on the field. We got Jesus, that's good, but it's always a good idea to make sure we recognize who these Pharisees are. So the Pharisees are not maybe what we always kind of think. They are lay people. Maybe the easiest way to, to think of it in terms of sort of where we are today is they're kind of like a political party. You got the Pharisees, you got the Sadducees, you got all the other little groups that are out there, out and about in the land. The Pharisees, there are more of them, but there's a problem because they don't have control of the Sanhedrin. That's in the hands of the Sadducees. They're trying to bring reform from within. 
because they think the Sadducees are really corrupt. They don't get along with one another. In fact, in the book of Acts, they're going to get in a fist fight over Paul, which tells you there's a real enemy of my enemy is my friend situation that's starting to develop. So these are just regular old lay folk that are trying to do the best they can to keep the law, to follow the traditions, because they think if they follow the traditions well, that God's going to intervene on their behalf, and he's going to end their exile and forgive their sins. And then the other side of the equation, at the end of the day, we have the experts of the law. If a Venn diagram won't freak you out, you've got here the Pharisees, and the little group in here are the experts, okay? So we've got the big group, we've got the experts, and you'll see why the experts, well, you can insult, you can insult all these folks in our larger party, but don't insult us because we're the ones in charge, okay? All right, so that's the setting as we get rolling here. All right, so let's see what happens next. Stage is set, Jesus has kind of tweaked them a little bit, and now it's going to start to get interesting, and the way that it's going to get interesting is this question of cups and people. Cups are going to be kind of an image for people. And so the question is, well, what matters? Is it the outside? Is it the inside? Well, let's see what Jesus says. There in verse 39. But the Lord said to him, okay, so he's responding. And notice, by the way, that there's not been anything to tell us that the Pharisee said his objection out loud. Now, maybe it was written all over his face, or maybe Jesus just knows what he's thinking because clearly he has that ability. And by the way, notice that Luke goes out of his way to say, the Lord, he's showing us who's really in charge here, is Jesus. He didn't use that a lot, but he uses it here. Now, notice what Jesus says. Now, you Pharisees, Clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, you're full of greed and evil. Oh, boy. Fools! It's better. Didn't he who made the outside make the inside too? But give from what is within to the poor, and then everything is clean for you. Now, one quick thing here, verse 41. Almsgiving is seen as a test of whether or not you truly believe the message. That's why, like, for instance, and when I read this this week, and one of the commentaries kind of blew my mind, when we get to Acts chapter 10, this passage is in Luke's mind. In Acts chapter 10, where Cornelius is one who gives alms, he's a Gentile God-fearer who doesn't keep the food laws and hasn't been circumcised, but he gives alms to the Jews. He takes care of the poor, and the vision to Peter is... Cornelius is clean because he's doing what matters because it shows his heart has changed. He cares about people more than possessions. Now, what we've got here is a clash. Jesus is on this side that interior transformation is what matters. The Pharisees are over here, and they're concerned about external action. So this is going to lead to a clash. And really, we have to ask ourselves the question, one of these arrows has to turn so they're going to be in alignment. The question is, which one? The Pharisees think, we'll do until we change. Well, that's never worked. A lot of people today think it will. I do to show who I am am, that's just a disaster. What matters is an interior transformation of the heart that then is going to lead to this arrow changing and being going in the other direction, aligned with the principles and plan and purpose of God. So now we have this illustration of the cup. So the question is, is this outside part what makes it clean or what's inside. Make sense? Now here's the irony of all this. Jesus can touch, now by the way, we don't think this way, but really it wouldn't be a bad idea because purity kind of like, works like germs. That, that if something is impure and you touch it, it's not, it's, it's attacking the thing. And it's going to attack and attack and attack until it fades out. So the question is, 
What matters, the outside or the inside? Well, obviously, if interior transformation is what matters, it's the inside. In their laws even, here's the kicker. If you have an unclean hand and you touch a clean cup, it's not going to affect what's inside the cup. So they're even being hypocritical in and of themselves. What matters is not what's outside. Like in Mark 7 when Jesus declares all foods clean, praise the Lord. It's not what comes into a man from the outside that makes him unclean. It's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And so what he's getting at here is you've got this cup and you're really worried about me touching this cup. What matters is what's on the inside and what's on the inside is your greed. Other places he's going to say they're lovers of money. What's on the inside is greed and evil. All because Jesus laid down and didn't wash his hands. Well, you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse. So let's see what happens. Woes for everybody. So let's read this really quickly. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb and bypass justice, love for neighbor, and love for God. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Okay, that's one. Woe to you, Pharisees. You love the front seat in the synagogues. All right, front seat. In the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces, woe to you, you are like unmarked graves. This is getting even worse. You're like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't know it. Now, this is where the expert of the law steps in. It's like, yeah, you can make fun of all these people, but if you're making fun of all these people, Jesus, well, you're kind of making fun of us. Why are you doing that? We're better than they are. We don't deserve this. Uh, Well, you're going to get both barrels too, boys. All right, so... Then he said, verse 46, Woe to also you experts in the law. You load people with burdens that are hard to carry, and yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. That's number two. Therefore you are witnesses that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their monuments. Because of this, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute so that this generation may be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Now, oh, I didn't get that last one. You've taken the key to knowledge, and you didn't use it yourselves, and you've hindered those that want to go in. All right, so the first hypocrisy we see is a hypocrisy of practices. An hypocrisy of practices. So let's look at the first one. But woe to you Pharisees. You give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb. And you bypass, you drive by justice and love for God. See, here's the thing that Jesus is hitting on. What has he said before? That they're filled with greed on the inside and evil. You see, what he's trying to get them to recognize is that a tenth, giving a tenth doesn't mean you're generous. Giving a tenth doesn't mean that you care about people more than possessions. Giving a tenth is, in many ways, for them, a safety net. If we give a tenth of all these things, really going even beyond the law, if we give a tenth, then we can mark out what's God's and what's ours. In fact, in many ways, what he's getting at is your practice of tithing is actually a practice of greed. Because practices don't take the place of a changed heart. Now, notice he's going to say that this practice isn't bad. It's just got to come from the right place. Notice he says, these things you should have done without neglecting the others. So you can tithe without having a love for others or having a love for God. All right, now, you load people with burdens, you experts of the law, that are hard to carry, and that yet you yourselves don't touch these burdens with one of your fingers. Now think about that for a second, because a little bit earlier, Jesus said, if by the finger of God I cast out demons, you know the kingdom of God has come. 
And now he's saying, you won't even lift a finger. You know, like Ralphie's dad, not a finger. Not even a finger to help these people that you put burdens on their backs. Now think about that for a second. Their neglect is horrifying. When Jesus, simple by the finger of God, is liberating. Now, let's look at ourselves. What can our hypocrisy of practice be? Well, it can be just like theirs. Majoring on the minors. That's what they're doing. Majoring on the sins of others while excusing our own. That's what the experts in the law were doing. Making service to God so complex that people become exasperated. Making understanding the scriptures so difficult, such a maze that people just sit it down. I pray that what we do each week in opening the scriptures for you is the exact opposite. That it models how you can easily read the scriptures week after week after week. And in the end, it's withholding grace. Withholding the grace that we've received from others who need it. But there's another one, the hypocrisy of praise. So notice what we have here. Woe to you Pharisees, you love the front seat in the synagogues. You like to have the nicest place to sit. And you like folks looking at you and saying in the marketplace, there goes a Pharisee. Man, I'd like to be like him. Or we've got this building the tombs of the prophets thing. You see, both of these are looking for praise from people. And I think if we're wise, if we're wise, we will always be careful to ask ourselves, what is my motivation for my practice? Am I pursuing this action, this practice, this job, this responsibility because I want people to pat me on the back and say I'm great or because I want to glorify God. And if we're honest, that can be more complicated than we would frankly like to admit because we like praise and it can be a dangerous thing. But I think there's a fair question here, is why is building tombs for the prophet a reason for rebuke? That seems like a good thing. You know, like, why would it be bad to build the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Memorial or whatever it might be? Well, here's why. They're guilty, this is the point Jesus is making, they are guilty along with their fathers because they only listen to the dead prophets who judged all those dead people. And they won't listen to the living prophet who's sitting right in front of them. They're guilty. In fact, they're guilty of the blood of all of the prophets from Abel, Genesis, to this last one, Zechariah, who is the last person, if the order of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible ends at 2 Chronicles, he's the last prophet killed in the Old Testament from A to Z, from beginning to end. You're responsible for all of it because now you're preparing to kill the one that all of these prophets pointed to. The blood really is on your hand. So it leads to a question that we frankly don't want to ponder too often. But what is our own individual hypocrisy of praise? I don't really have a list for this one because for all of us it could be very different. But as we close in just a moment and come to our time of taking the Lord's Supper, I think it is incumbent upon us to to ask the Spirit to reveal this to us in ways that maybe we wouldn't like, but we really need. The last thing, 
the failure of false teaching. Woe to you, you are like unmarked graves. The people who walk over them don't know it. Now, why is that so problematic? Well, if you walk over a grave and you don't know it, you're unclean for seven days, and not only are you unclean, you're unclean and you don't know it. That's why they mark graves really carefully in Israel. And, by the way, why the, the Islamic invaders put uh, all of these dead bodies, this, uh, this uh, cemetery in front of the eastern gate, because the scriptures say the king is going to come through the eastern gate when he returns. He's going to be unclean. Well, there's nothing that makes the true king unclean. Because he takes our uncleanness and throws it away. So following you, Pharisees, makes you deader than before you started. You're like the walking dead. And not only that, woe to you experts in the law, you've taken away the key. Like, you are the teachers of the law. You have the key, you have the scriptures, you know the scriptures better than anybody in Israel, and you've taken the key to unlock the door, and you've put it in your pocket, and you're locking not only yourselves out, but everybody else. And Jesus says, at the beginning of this chapter, knock, and the door will be open. Knock at any time, day or night, and I'm there to open the door to life. Well, this has been hard for them. And the question is, what's the response going to be? Is it going to be the response of an enemy or the response of a friend? Well, it's going to be the response of an enemy. From here, they're going to begin the process of planning, lying in wait, figuring out how it is we can put this guy to death because there's one thing we can all agree on, this dude's got to die. What they don't realize is that's exactly why he came. To die in the place of sinners. But this morning, our real question is not the response of the Pharisees or the teacher of the law. Our question is, what's our response? Is our response to the confrontation of the Spirit, to our hypocrisy of practice or hypocrisy of praise, is it to be angry and sulk? Or is it to to repent and be restored? And I pray that as we move toward taking the Lord's Supper to sit at the Lord's table, to, to dine with him without need of ritual washing, because we've all who placed our faith in Jesus have been cleansed from the inside out by the one offering that Jesus made. For us to submit to the Spirit's work for a moment as the as the band comes and as the, the servers serve, let's quietly listen to the Lord. Head bowed, eyes closed. Just listen. Ask the question, Lord, how are my practices giving evidence of hypocrisy? Are there things that I'm doing out of legalism and not because your word commands it? Am I desiring grace that I'm unwilling to give? Am I expecting more of others than I expect of myself?
And then ask the Lord, look, what is my hypocrisy of praise? Like, what am I doing with just the wrong motive? It might be a good thing, even something that I need to keep on doing, but but my motive has to change. 